uh, but they tend to take approaches that have been uh, discussed or that have been designed already in other safety critical standards. Uh, and most of these products contain some sort of embedded software uh, and they have to deal with things like unit testing, code coverage and coding standards uh, that were first talked about in safety critical standards, uh, they talk about uh, doing that now. Um, and other examples like high security, military, banking and finance applications. So, FDA testing, so uh, FDA testing is for medical devices uh, and uh, there's a guidance in there and in general it talks about uh, section 5.25, uh, it talks about testing by the software developer and there it explicitly calls out the need to do unit testing, integration testing and system testing, so uh, three key phases of validating the software. Uh, and it goes into a bit more detail, it, it talks about uh, verifying the software and having some sort of ex expected inputs and expected outputs for the software. Uh, it uh, talks about uh, ensuring that just executing some code is, is, not, important. is not, not enough. You have to actually ensure that you're getting some correct results as well. Uh, it talks about doing unit testing, so looking at maybe an individual module, whether it's a C source file or a C++ class or an ADA package and then uh, Leading that up and doing integration testing and building that up to, to system testing. So having a process through uh, how you build the quality of the software. Uh, it talks about uh, measuring code coverage, so measuring which lines of code have been executed, uh, and the rigor at which you measure that should be associated with the risk level that you're building your software to. Uh, then talking about things like a regression analysis, so not just doing the testing once, but doing it in a way that it's repeatable, so that if you made an update to your software, it's very easy to quickly re-verify. Uh, and so it basically talks about breaking this up into unit integration and uh, system testing. Deal 1 suffered AB, so this is a standard that's been used in the avionics industry, and so any software that flies in an aircraft uh, is uh, certified to the standard, and then there are many different levels between uh, where you know, level A is the highest, going down to level uh, D and E, which is the lowest, and level A, B, and C are of interest because of the uh, amount of code coverage uh, where there's more rigor or testing required on the software before it can be released. In IEC 61.5.8, there's a SIL 1, SIL 2, SIL 3, SIL 4, where SIL 1 is the lowest and the SIL 4 is the highest. Uh, and again, there's a correlation between the risk level and the sort of code coverage that someone needs to do to prove that it's been properly tested to ensure that the risk has been uh, mitigated in some way. So other standards, there's things like MISRA, which is a coding standard which is quite commonly used in the automotive industry. Uh, the Senelec again, which uh, derives from 6158, so has a very similar process uh, and concept. And in particular, EN 5128, which deals specifically with building software in the standard. Automotive standards, uh, there's ISO 26262. Uh, and so this is a new standard that relates uh, to, uh, to building software in the automotive industry. Uh, it talks about functional safety and testing for requirements. And again, doing a risk-based approach, so looking at what component you're building. Are you building a cluster in a car? Are you building an airbag or a braking system? And based on that, uh, looking at uh, what sort of testing, again, you should be doing to ensure that the software is being properly tested. So, looking at the, the different testing, so unit testing. So, unit testing is talking about testing the smallest piece of testable software. So, a single C or C++ source file. And typically, to test this, you need to build some framework around the code. So, you need a test driver that will stimulate the code, and you need some test stubs uh, for the dependencies. So, you can control the behavior of, uh, of these dependencies and create scenarios that may not be uh, uh, that easy to create in a system test uh, situation. Um, and so here what we want to be able to do is quickly create some test cases and measure code coverage from this process. Integration testing is just the next logical step up, so now instead of working with a single source file, we're talking about working with multiple source files working together, and maybe like a subsystem and verifying the behavior of this subsystem in isolation to the rest of the system. System testing, so this is where you're testing the entire system, so this is like I press the button on the box and the light goes green, or I put my foot down in the accelerator and uh, the engine revs and the car goes faster. And so the interesting thing about system testing is that you can typically get a high level of code coverage from doing this process. So for organizations that are concerned with the safety critical standard, being able to get code coverage from system testing can actually reduce the amount of effort you need to do uh, to achieve that code coverage requirement. Uh, for, 
for whichever standard you're certifying to. Regression testing, so regression testing talks about not just doing your testing once, but being able to re-execute it. So um, making sure that you're building these, the, your test cases in such a way that if the code changes underneath, um, you can easily rerun the test cases without having to spend manual time and effort to be able to do this. So, so unit testing and integration testing. So let's look at a quick example. So if you look at uh, the source files in unit testing, what we want to do is pick out some of these source files. And for these source files, we want to build, build stub dependents. Okay, so, so these will be stops for the dependencies. Uh, you might have some real dependent object files. Maybe you're running with an operating system, or maybe you have like a, a CAN bus that you, or protocol stack that you want to integrate as part of the testing, so you can include this. Uh, and you have the test driver, which is going to be stimulating the code uh, to, to get it to, to do the scenarios that you want it to do. Okay. So uh, if we talk about embedded testing, so embedded testing talks about not just running the test cases on a PC, but running on your real hardware. And so as part of this, there are two important things about running the automating running the test cases on the target. Uh, the first part is, uh, is talking about you know, understanding the compiler you're working with. So uh, what you'll find is that when you're, when you're trying to do unit testing, you'll have to work with an embedded compiler, and if you want to build these frameworks, uh, you need to be able to maybe parse the code or do something like that. So this is what a test automation tool would do. Um, the other part of it is uh, collecting the results from that execution. So will I get it back through a JTAG interface or a serial interface uh, or, or some kind of interface that's available on the, on the system? So the goals of uh, unit testing, so that there are three key parts of unit testing. So the first one, which is the most obvious one, is requirements testing. So this is where you have some requirements and you want to ensure that the requirements have been met. Uh, but then there are some more interesting scenarios uh, that we want to look at, like robustness testing. So how can we uh, test at normal and out of range values and boundary values? Uh, so testing at the boundaries of the types that we're working with. Uh, talking about improvements classes as well. So you know, in C and C++, uh, there isn't very strict typing. So uh, in that situation, you can be working with an integer type, which might be our unsigned integer, which is holding the velocity of a car. And while uh, it's interesting to, to look at uh, what uh, the range of an integer is, it's also interesting to look at the behavior of what the velocity is, which is maybe between 0 and 330 miles an hour. And you want to test what the behavior of the hood is at those boundaries, along with the boundaries of the type, of the, the base type that's holding it as well. And then combinational testing as well, like what happens if I test the minimum value of this parameter with the maximum value of that parameter? Is, is that going to create a scenario where we're doing a sub subtraction or an addition and it will cause it to divide by zero? So looking at those kind of combinations at the edges and quickly seeing whether the software actually works when those scenarios are presented to us. So how Vectorcast supports this, so if you talk about the V model, uh, going up the V model, uh, you have, uh, back up the V model, you have uh, tools to help you with unit testing, so being able to look at your source code and being able to quickly build a framework around the code to build in the test driver and the test stops uh, from parsing the code. Uh, and then also working with embedded compilers, one of the important things to think about is if you're working with a test automation tool, uh, every test automation tool needs to parse your source code to be able to build the framework. Uh, one of the challenges though is that if you work with an embedded compiler, uh, you have uh, not only the standard C and C++ language, but you also have these keywords that the compilers have, like underscore interrupt handler, or primary pack, or like a proprietary type like float 18 if you're working with a DSP. And so the challenge here is when you're working with the target, is or when you work with an embedded compiler, is, as these parses from all these test automation tools parse your code, they understand standard C and C++, but they don't understand these keywords. So you have to teach the tool how to understand these keywords. And so the traditional way to do this is to, to do like a macro, so you say hash define uh, underscore interrupt handler equals void space, or hash define fragment pack equals a void space. And so what happens is when you build your framework and execute the test cases, the binary code for the code that you're testing is completely different to the binary code running in the real system because you had to modify it to automate the process of testing it. So if you're building a TV, this is maybe not so important, but if you're building a flight control system for an aircraft, you have to understand what the difference is of modifying the code. So with the vector cast, one of the key differences is that when we say that we support a compiler, we understand all the keywords as well. So we don't modify your source code. So what that means is that the binary code that you're unit testing is actually identical to the binary code running the real system. 
service. We're the only tool that does this. Now, the other thing that we spoke about is requirements. So if you're building a, a safety critical system, you'll have requirements and you want to show that the requirements are being tested. So being able to link the requirements that you have in the requirements management tool to your test cases means that if you change a requirement, you can immediately see which test cases are impacted by that. And you can very quickly work on what test cases need to be updated for that requirement. You can also scope out what work, additional work needs to be done. And you can also store those results back in the requirements tool. And then from code coverage point of view, so we spoke about doing system testing, unit testing, and integration testing. So if one of your key goals is to get code coverage, as we said before, you can get about 60 to 70 percent code coverage from system testing. So the idea here is that you can get code coverage from system testing, and you can take that coverage information, put it into the unit test tool, and then inside the unit test tool, you can see what code hasn't been tested. And then you can only have to build unit test cases for the code that hasn't been tested. And maybe you can do some further analysis of things like basis path analysis on your code. And so this gives you additional information, like uh, what the parts are that exist in the code, and you can see what parts have been executed and what parts haven't been executed. And from that you can work out maybe there's a requirement you haven't tested, or maybe this, the code shouldn't be there in the, in, the, in, the, in the application, and you can work out what to do with that. So requirements traceability, so being able to link the requirements to your requirements management tool, regression testing, so not just doing the process once, but being able to repeat it continuously. So uh, what we talk about here is you know, if you build a unit test case for module A and a unit test case for module C and, and so on, and you build all these different unit test frameworks, what you want to be able to do is say, okay, I'm building a product uh, for BMW, and uh, now I'm taking that same platform and I want to build it for Audi, but maybe the hardware is a little bit different, but the source code is still exactly the same. So I, want, I don't want to like completely rewrite all my test frameworks for the, for, the, for the new platform that I want to support. I just want to be able to say, okay, I've done my testing here, let me drag that and drop it in, in the new configuration and re-verify the behavior, and just drag and drop and migrate the test cases. So the Vectorcast Manage Tool gives you the ability to abstract your test cases and your environments from the source code and the compiler you're working with. And so then it's very easy to maintain multiple baselines and do quick validations like that. And also do trend analysis to see the quality of your software over time and see if it's improving or getting worse and so on. So I have a quick demonstration now and so this is just a demonstration of the tool working. So. Uh, So, I have a very simple example that I'm going to show you Vectorcast working with today. Uh, it's, it seems like it's an appropriate example because it's just after lunch and if you're like me, maybe you haven't had lunch already, so we can do an order here. So, uh, the example is about someone going to a restaurant and ordering some food and it's a very simple example, but I think it's an interesting example just because it deals with all the key concepts of, uh, of the C and C++ language. So here you can see the different compilers that we support. And so, I don't know if some of you are working with ARM or with IAR or with Kyle or maybe with Green Hills. So you can see the different configurations here. Um, this example I'm doing today is with Visual Studio just because it's easy and it's a C++ example. I'll also show you uh, the requirements traceability as well. So I'll do the linkage with requirements. I'll say next. And so here I get the environment and name. So I'll call uh, the example I'm going to test is called Manage. And I, you can do different kinds of testing here. So you can do traditional unit testing where the source code already exists. Uh, you can do tester development. So tester development is where you, have, uh, uh, you haven't written the source code yet. You just have the APIs for the functions. And you want to start defining test cases before you write the source code. And so while this has had a tester development has been very popular in the commercial world, in the embedded world, it hasn't really caught on yet. But in the last two years, we've started seeing safety critical companies looking at it because the whole process of test driven development talks about having requirements, building test cases, and then writing code. And that fits in very well with building a safety critical application. But anyway, for today's example, we'll do traditional unit testing. We can choose what kind of code coverage we want. We can do white box and black box testing. So if we do white box, this gives us visibility into all the locally defined variables and locally defined functions. And in C++, it gives us access to private and protected data. And again, we do this without modifying the source code. So I'll tell Vectorcast where the source code is located. So I'm doing everything graphically today, but all of this can be automated from the command line. So it's, uh, everything here is fully automatable. So here we can see the source files that we want to test. 
So I can pick and choose a source file that I want to test, and I can tell VectorCast, let's stop all the dependencies, or I can say, uh, let's not stop any of the dependencies, let's use all the real code for the dependencies, or I can say custom, and if I choose custom, I can have VectorCast do the dependency analysis for me, and based on this, I can pick and choose uh, which units I want to stop. So I can say, okay, manager driver is dependent on database and manager, and okay, so let's use the real code for database and stop manager, or maybe let's use the real code for manager and stop database, and I can build like a hybrid system like this or an integration test. Anyway, for this example, it's more interesting to look at manager, so we'll uh, pick that and we'll say build. So VectorCast now passes my source code, so I haven't had to prepare it in any way for VectorCast to understand it. It passes it, it builds the whole thing, uh, builds executable, and gives me a tree structure where I can start creating some test cases. So here, if you look at the source code very briefly, you can look at the different functions that are here. So you can see manager, this is a, this is a C++ example. So this is the constructor, so you can see it here, manager, and add included dessert, and you can see place order here, and if I scroll down, you can see uh, clear table, and get check total, and add party to waiting list. So you can see all the different functions that are available here. So let's take a look at place order where I want to, to do some testing. So this function takes three parameters. So the first parameter it takes is a table. The second parameter takes the seat, which is of a type integer. And the third parameter it takes is, a, is order, which is of a user defined type. So I can come to my test case here and I'll say insert test case. And I see a table structure that shows me what's available to test. And I can start specifying some values here. So you see the same three parameters. So if I go to the properties tab here for table, I can start specifying some values. So one of the first things we can do here is VectorCast already knows the ranges of all your types that you're working with. So whether it's a 32-bit, 64-bit, 16-bit, 8-bit, we automatically know what the size of integer, char, flow, short, all those different things are. So I can set this to some special values like min minus 1 and max plus 1, out-of-bound values or minimum for the type, or I can set my own value like 1 or 12. I can set a range of values, so maybe let's say let's test this between the minimum value of the type and a thousand gradient steps of 10, or maybe we'll start from zero and go steps of 10. I can do a list of values, so I can say here maybe it's interesting to test for prime numbers, so 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on, and build up my own custom list. I can write user code, so here I can write code for the specific thing, maybe. You can write any legal C or C++ code here, so I can call like the standard library functions and use them to generate the values. Or I can reference back to other parameters in the code, do some manipulations on it, and then uh, use that as an input for the function I want to test. Anyway, for this example, we'll keep it simple, so for table we'll say 1, for seat we'll say 1, we'll have lunch by ourselves, and Order is a structure, you can see vector cast automatically knows all the fields in the structure, so I don't have to go back to the source code. All the information is presented to me. And these are all enumerations, so vector cast gives me a drop down list of all the valid enumerations. So we'll have onion soup and we'll have Caesar salad. And for entree, okay, we're going to be healthy, we'll have chicken. And for dessert, okay, we're in Germany, we'll have cake. And uh, for beverage, we have, we're working, so uh, we'll have some soda today, some sparkling water. Okay. And so just like that, I can specify the input values for the test case that I want. Now, because this is a C++ example, I can also initialize the class, and I can even initialize uh, internal member attributes or any global data before I run the test case. So now the next thing I want to do here is I want to check the expected results. So uh, I can look at the global data here, and I can say maybe when this is executed, this should return with a value of 10. Or maybe when this function returns, there was no chicken available, so it should return steak. So I can pick and choose like this uh, what I want. Or I can even uh, look at the stop subprograms. So in this particular example, place sort of calls all of these functions. So it calls a get table record at the start of uh, the function. And so what we want to do is we want to inject a value into this scenario so that it will execute a particular thing. So we'll tell a vector cast. When get table record is called, I, will, I, can, I can return a null pointer or I can return a valid pointer here. So I'll return a, a buffer of one and it gives me a structure here. And again, I haven't had to write any code to allocate memory or to reference this data structure that's been allocated. And in here we can, I can say when I return this pointer, let's uh, set the string value to be William. William will be serving as the meal today. Now what I want to do is I want to check some values. So I'll look at update table record. And here we can set some expected values. So here, for example, we'll say table should be 1. Uh, here, this again is a pointer, so I want to do one reference of the pointer. And I'll expand this, and so the table should be occupied to so true. 
uh, this one person in the party, again, will confirm the wait person's name is still William. This is an array, so I want to look at uh, an index in the array, so I'll choose index 1. And in here I can start specifying some values again, so we'll have uh, onion soup, and we'll have uh, Caesar salad, and uh, again the chicken that we said confirmed that we got that, the cake, and the soda. And here I can specify for the, the check total or the bill total a, a, a value like this, so a range of values between 1 and 10, or I can say something like 10 plus or minus, uh, plus or minus 5. Or if I'm working with floating points, I can put a tolerance here and say plus or minus 5%. Anyway, for this example, it's interesting to say this. I'll save this, and I'll execute our first test case. So you can see here, when the test case executes, we get an execution report which is broken up into a number of events. The first and last event is the entry and exit into the function on the test, and each intermediate event is a call into a stop sub program. So there you see the call to get table record, the call to see the call to update table record and the values that are in here, and finally you see the, the place order, the exit of the place order. So now that we have our first test case, we've done a lot of initialization for us. If we want to create our second test case, we don't have to rewrite all the values, we can just say duplicate, or I can even like copy nodes in the structure, so I can say copy copy this value here, um, copy that, and I can copy and paste it into another thing. So anyway, with this example, we're having chicken, let's have steak. And we'll save this, and we'll do a batch execution of the test cases. And so now you can see one test case is passed and one is failed. So I can go and look at the test case that's failed. I can go to the execution report, and if I scroll down here, I can see, right, I changed the input from chicken to steak, but I didn't change the expected, and steak is more expensive. So I can go to the parameter tree, and again here I can change this value so I, I know that this is wrong. Or if I know that the results are correct, I can set the expected values from the actual results, and automatically set the values like that. So what I'll do now is I'll also switch on some code coverage. Um, we can execute these test cases. So if we execute the test cases now, both the test cases pass, we can see that they're in green. We have some coverage information. Uh, we have the report here, this is HTML report, showing us what the results of the test cases are, and then the parser and the, the code coverage. And if I, I tick this box here, I can view the code coverage information here inside the code. So a red line of code is a line of code that doesn't have coverage, an orange line of code is a line of code that has partial coverage, green line is a line that has full coverage, and a black line of code is a line of code that's not an executable line of code. And so the nice thing here is as I tick these boxes, I can view the additional code coverage. So I can view code coverage for a specific test case, I can view the code coverage uh, for all combined together, like so. And even with the metrics as well, as I tick the boxes, you can view the metric information too, all these things. Now, I just want to do one little thing here. I guess not many of you uh, would have heard of basis path, but basis path analysis is an extension of your cyclomatic code complexity. So when you look at a particular function and it has a complexity of n, what that means is you would have n different paths through the code. So basis path analysis is the identification of these paths. So with vector paths, we can identify these paths in your code. So for this example here, place order, I can see that uh, uh, it has five different paths because it's a big case statement. So VectorCast tells me that it has a complexity of five, there are five different paths. And by executing the code through all these paths, I can get 100% code coverage. So by ticking the code, the, the code coverage boxes, I can see which paths in the code have been covered and which paths haven't been covered. So this tells me exactly what I need to test. And so I can look at a more complicated example like I'd include a dessert. And here you can see it identifies the path, it tells us at each conditional point what the value should be, and it tells us that only part two has been covered. So if I want to improve code coverage here, I can start looking at some automatically created test cases, so I'll just switch on the normal coverage again. And I can start looking at some automatically created test cases. So I can do boundary case test cases. So these are like min, mid, max test cases where all the input values are set to the minimum, the mid values, or the maximum values of the types. I can do partition test cases. So these are like, we spoke about robustness test cases. So this is where all the input parameters are iterated between the minimum and maximum value for a set number of partitions. And so we do all of the permutations to validate that the code works with all different combinations of input types. 
the other thing that we can do is basis part test cases. So basis part test cases uses the basis part analysis to try and predict the input value. So you can see here with the basis part test cases, this is for the default scenario, this is for the steak scenario, this is for the chicken scenario, lobster, and pasta scenario. And I can do this actually for the whole example. I can uh, insert all of the basis part test cases. And if I execute the code now, with a couple of mouse clicks, I can create all of the test cases that are required for 100% code coverage. And again, I haven't had to write any code, I don't have to understand the code or anything like that. So you can see here now we have 100% statement coverage, and you can see down here we have all the code coverage that we need. So we can now look at the requirements and start doing some linkage there, and doing some additional things to, to, to verify the system. So that's a very quick demonstration of the tool. If, you, if, you have, uh, if you're more interested in a more detailed demonstration, please come by our booth and uh, we'd be happy to go through that. So just to, to conclude. So, so I just wanted to quickly talk about some success stories. So we've had some very good success here in Germany. We have companies like Bombardier who are standardized on vector class for all of the rail signaling systems that they're building, both here in Germany and in Sweden. Uh, we have companies like Siemens and EBG who do this use for trains. Uh, we have avionics, so EABS is our biggest customer here in Germany. They're standardized on vector class for all of the military and avionics software that they build. Uh, and we have medical customers as well. So uh, and we, have, we have a big press release today, uh, so Fujitsu, uh, for all of their automotive software that they're building with concern for ISO 26262. They're using Vectorcast now, and they're doing this not only for themselves, but for all of the customers that are working with them as well. So again, if you're interested and you'd like to see how Vectorcast can help your project, please come by the booth, we're in stand 115. Uh, we have a YouTube station, so we're all high tech now, so you can go online and we do some video demonstrations and maybe see Vectorcast working with your target. We also have a LinkedIn and a Facebook page as well. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, and uh, if you're interested in more information, please come and see us. Thank you.